Let's go back. Back to Southern California, where Karen and Richard grew up. Back to the home in Downey, where their parents still live today. Long ago, and oh so far away, I fell in love with you. primary discourse on anorexia is available to most um, lay, lay people to be so insufficient mm -hmm. and so symptomatic, I think, of a lot of sort of blind spots around issues around women's bodies um, and um, identity. And, and it became a target of the film and it became one of the ways that we played with this other element, the sort of pseudo um, documentary passages of the film which certainly were arch and meant, were meant to be. The affliction which eventually destroyed Karen Carpenter is one that plagues many, many young women like her. The name of this private obsession? Anorexia nervosa. What is anorexia nervosa? I mean, now, just, you know, irony is such a kind of almost a, uh, it's, the, it's the given, it's the sort of first place you go in how to approach um, serious material and, and uh, comedy or whatever. At the time, it was really um, it really raised people's um, shackles over how how we were talking about these issues. But ironically, and this was a funny phenomenon. Just so so for three years, the film was freely distributed. I knew its days were numbered. I knew as soon as it got any kind of press like that, the Carpenters just didn't find out. We had no rights to the music. It was going to be it. Uh, was going to, the doors were going to close. But in that time, even within that relatively short amount of time, the, the film would be used in clinics as a tool for discussion among anorexics. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. Like there was just such a dearth of material that could be used that way and could, you know, kind of try to get a little bit beneath the surface of what was sort of widely available information. So I thought that was so great. And so when we did get the cease and desists in 1990, I did at least sort of plead with them. I just said, look, at least, and it was shown in schools and then this film courses and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, great. That's so, I mean, I couldn't have dreamed of anything like any of that happening with the first film that was being shown. Uh, but I said to the Carpenters folks and the lawyers, I was like, could you guys at least reserve the right for the film to be shown to films, to schools and clinics, and, and we would give all the proceeds to the Karen Carpenter Memorial Foundation for anorexia research. And they're like, no. Wow. Yeah. Did they ever so, say why? Why to? You know, initially, I don't think they actually saw the film. I think it was just, and, and what's funny about this film is that it's very hard to describe it and, and to imagine that it has anything but a kind of mean spiritedness at its core and that it isn't just a laugh riot kind of send up of Karen Carpenter. And you gotta remember Karen Carpenter, even while she was alive, was a target mm -hmm. of sort of more liberal uh, popular culture where Bette Midler would kind of say nasty things about Karen Carpenter on the Grammys when they were winning Grammys. You know, it was only a year ago that Karen Carpenter crowned me the uh, best new artist of the year. And uh, if that ain't the kiss of death, honey, I don't know what is. Like at the time, they were seen as the sort of cornball, you know, n you know, Nixon-loving uh, brother or sister pop team. Um, so, and, and I had sort of forgotten all about them. And then I, I'd heard, and then I heard some of that music. Um, and I, and, and it was before there was like retro 1970s radio stations, and there was sort of a. Uh, nostalgia culture around the 1970s. It just wasn't really, it was only 1986 when we were making the movie. And, um, and, and she had died and all of a sudden those songs which you kind of rolled your eyes to because they felt so incredibly manipulative the way that they're constructed and her voice with that kind of sort of pretense of, of sophistication and suffering all of a sudden sounded like it was full of suffering. Mm -hmm. because of what had happened, not only to her, but to all of us since the early 70s. 
uh, the whole Nixon era and water and Vietnam and Watergate and all all of the uh, disillusionment and changes that we that we sort of began to look behind the surface of what we were being told. Um, uh, it just felt like such rich material. So Cynthia and I had a little. We wanted to redeem Karen's reputation in a way. <laughs>